All right, gang, take your Bible and open it to Acts chapter 16. We're actually going to pick up where we left off last time. Last week we were in Acts chapter 16, and we're going to begin in Acts chapter 16 again today. Obviously, and I hope this is obvious thus far into this series, very, very few of us appreciate uncertainty, right? If there's one thing that's come through over the past few weeks, as we've examined the idea of where we are in time, this season in our lives, but also where the nation and the world have been for the past several months, it ought to be obvious to all of us that nobody appreciates uncertainty. Being forced to recalculate makes us nervous. It might even frustrate us and make us angry. So uneasiness and frustration, that's typical, that's understandable on some level. America is uneasy. We're frustrated by the recalculation over the past few months. I mean, think about this virus. Once again, sorry to bring it up. The coronavirus has altered our schedules, has it not? It's changed our plans. I mean, I had a vacation plan for this summer. Uh, we've got a little kind of go away, kind of big weekend plan, but all of that's changed because of a virus. And then when you turn on your television and you tune into news, which you ought not do very much of that, in my opinion, social unrest, the rioting that we see, the injustice that's before our very eyes, it's not only frustrating, it makes us uneasy. You realize that there are men and women who have poured their lives into a business. They don't have an IRA. They don't have a retirement plan. Like my father, their retirement plan is their business. They've built a business that sustained their family through the decades, and one day they hope to sell that business that they can retire comfortably. But now their business is on fire. Now their business is gone. Makes us uneasy, doesn't it? Who's to blame? Where do you point the finger? The talking heads on television only further frustrate me, so I'm done with them. <laughs> For every half hour of news I'm consuming, I'm trying to spend at least a half hour in prayer, and I encourage you to do the same. Uncertainty is not something we appreciate. We get used to knowing, and that makes us comfortable. In fact, we go to great lengths to set up our lives in the know. We enjoy having a doctor be able to explain it to us, or an expert be able to solve our problem, but what do you do when doctors disagree, when experts disagree? Recalculate is a series of messages designed to help us get through uneasy seasons in life, and I believe we're in one of them. Hopefully, you've figured out that the early church knew about recalculation. They knew about uncertainty. Every message this series has been centered in the book of Acts, which is the story of the developing early church. The first century church, they knew uncertainty, they knew suffering, they knew persecution, and Acts tells their story. In week one, we dealt with the subject of who we are in Christ. Who am I as a child of God? And does that change? How is that affected when we're forced to recalculate? I'm a child of God. I need not forget that. I need not table that. I need not somehow consider that less important today while we recalculate, while we regroup than it was months ago. Imagine getting lost in a big city. You've never been there before. And the moment you realize you're lost, let's say that's the moment you decide to ditch your GPS or throw your maps out the window. That'd be the absolute worst move you could make at the most inopportune time. That's what happens when we forget who we are during seasons of uncertainty. In week two, we talked about what we all know. Now, granted, there's much we don't know, right? Dr. Fauci doesn't know everything, right? Had a doctor tell me recently, you realize, Mike, if I test positive for coronavirus, I don't have to quarantine for 14 days. I keep coming to work, wear my mask, and see my patients. Did you know that? I don't know how schools are going to remain open if a child tests positive for COVID-19 and every child who sits at their table 
or every child who's in the classroom has to go home for 14 days, I feel like it won't be long before no children will be at school. We're being forced to recalculate. And I don't know what's right and what's wrong. And you don't know either. And the talking heads on television, they don't know either. But there are some things we do know. Some very important things we know. The first century church knew that this life is not all that matters. They lived in light of the next life. Jesus promised when he ascended, I will return. I'm coming back. They assumed it would happen during their lifetime. That's why they refused to get tangled up in possessions and obligations. and They refused to store up treasures for themselves. They built up treasures for the kingdom. Jesus Christ could come back today. We know that. I might not finish this message before the king returns. And that is what they knew. In week three, last time, we talked about what really matters. And that's the mission. Since Jesus Christ could return at any moment, that makes the mission of utmost importance. Now, you don't have to be a a missionary to participate in the mission or a, a theologian to write books to participate in the mission or a minister even. All of us as followers of Jesus Christ are responsible for the mission. Go into all the world and share my story. Baptize followers. Teach them. And Jesus said, I'll be with you always. The early church didn't look for contentment and happiness and satisfaction within themselves or even within this life. They found it by connecting themselves with something much bigger than themselves. Today, we're going to talk about who God is. Who God is. I think it's important when we're forced to recalculate, when we're uncertain about our future, to reflect on who God really is. What do you do when your circumstances challenge your faith? What do you do when, by looking this way, it makes you unsure when you look this way? What do you do? How do you respond? Many years ago, Amy and I were driving a motorhome, big diesel pusher up in Michigan, pulling a vehicle behind it, about a 20-ton rig. It was about 10.30 in the evening. It was dark, and it began to snow, and it began to snow heavily. We got to a place in the four-lane where the flashing lights of the patrol cars could be seen. There were flares along the road, and there was a man standing out there waving his arms. Evidently, there was an accident ahead. And while we had been making good progress and we were close to our destination, we had to take a detour. And so as soon as I turned that big rig down this little two-lane road, my GPS said, recalculating, recalculating. And the farther we drove, we're only doing about 20 miles an hour, but the snow's beginning to build and the back end of that diesel RV starting to slide back and forth. I'd never driven in the snow. I grew up in Florida. The road felt like it was getting more and more narrow. We went across a bridge, I swear, it was a footbridge. I'll bet you we broke the law when we took that 20-ton rig across that little teeny bridge. And I told Amy, she's sitting over there. Of course, I'm acting like, I got it, babe. I got it. These giant windshield wipers on that RV going, wham, 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 wham. And it's just as dark as it can be. And my GPS would say, turn left, and we'd turn left, and I'd think, oh my gosh, this road is worse than the last road. It'd say, turn right, we'd turn right, and I'd go, oh, we're never going to make it. We're going to slide this big rig off into the ditch, and we're going to be stuck here. Surprise, here's vacation. (laughs) But sure enough, we made one last turn, and we were back out on that four lane, and we reached our destination. Let me ask you something. How do you respond when your circumstances don't seem to reveal or support what you know and believe about God. We've been taught since we were little kids that God is good, right? Didn't you say that when you were four? God is great. God is good. Didn't you say that? Aren't you teaching your kids to say that? Well, how good is God when someone you love is diagnosed with a terminal illness? How good is God when someone you love is declining slowly toward death? and suffering. How good is God then? We've been taught that God has a plan for our lives, and we take great 
solace in the fact that God has a plan. He'll guide me. Well, what if you feel stuck in your job? What if you feel trapped financially? What if you feel like your job is meaningless and you're trapped? We've been taught that God is in control. But what what about when the future seems as unclear as ours may seem at this moment? We've been taught that God will meet our needs over and over in this book from Genesis to Revelation. God is going to meet my needs. Well, how long it has it been? How long do we have to wait? What if you feel unhappy? You're unfulfilled. Look, let me lay a big statement on you as we kick this off. Here it is. Big statement. When our circumstances challenge our faith, we should act on what we know about God, not on what we feel. Okay? Make sure that sinks in for a moment. When our circumstances challenge our faith, that's what recalculation is. That's what uncertainty is. We should act on what we know about God, not on what we feel. And sadly, that's so unlike us, isn't it? That is so unlike us. We prefer to act on what we feel, do we not? I mean, when we feel like a failure, what do we do? We pout. Men are particularly bad about this, right? When a man feels like a failure, he pouts. It's embarrassing. When we feel like we've been taken advantage of by someone, what do we do? We begin to plot our revenge. We're going to make this right, right? Or we refuse to forgive, and we hold a grudge. Because I can't seem to forget what you said or what you've done, then I'm not going to forgive. When we feel afraid, look at how fear has gripped our nation. When we feel afraid, what do we do? Sometimes we retreat, we curl up, we ball up. We hide, all because we feel afraid. Even if we don't curl up, we get comfortable in a life that assumes no risk. We never step out. We never put ourselves out there because we've gotten too comfortable. It it feels too safe this way. What do we do when we feel unappreciated? Nobody appreciates me. There are a lot of bitter and sour employees out there because they feel unappreciated, right? You work with some of them, don't you? You may be one of them. So why in the world would I make the effort to overcome those feelings in order to focus on something I supposedly believe about God? What's the payoff? Again, look, I get it. I'm not saying it's easy. But I'm telling you, it's very difficult to act one way when my circumstance seems to demand I act another. Okay, in other words, follow me. It's very difficult to serve other people when I'm standing back wishing somebody would lend me a helping hand. Very difficult to try and help someone else when I'm feeling like, gee, I need a little help on my own. It's very difficult to give when I'm unsure about my financial future, right? It's very difficult to love someone A, who is very much unlike me, sees the world a different way, and B, might be taking our nation in the wrong direction. Very difficult to love that kind of person. Very difficult to act when the risk seems so high. So why in the world should I ignore those feelings and act upon what I know about God? Why? What's the payoff? Why do it? The early church did it, but why should I? Here's why. Big statement. I put it in the program. The reason is because God has always remained true to himself. That's why I should trust him. God has always acted like God. God's never had a bad day, never been a little off. God has always been true to himself. That's why I should trust him. That's the model in this book. From Genesis to Revelation, Old Testament, New Testament, The people we admire, the people we idolize, the people we put up on a pedestal, they knew God would remain true to himself. I'm talking about Abraham and Moses and David and Esther and Peter and the disciples and Mary and today, Acts 16, Paul and Silas. Look, church, please hear me when I say, 
every time you focus on the character and the nature of God and refuse to focus on your circumstance, you grow in your faith walk every time, without exception. Every time you intentionally focus on who God is, the character and the nature of God, and refuse to become consumed by your circumstance, you grow a little in your faith walk. And by growing, you set yourself up for the blessing. Paul and Silas in Acts 16 are going to wind up in prison. (laughs) I don't know if you know this or not, but two kinds of people in prison, those who did it, and tragically, some who didn't. But one thing they both have in common is they all want to get out, except for Paul and Silas. It's going to blow you away if you don't know this story. When Paul was converted, we'll call it, when he embraced authentic faith in Jesus Christ, you can read about that in Acts chapter 9. When he decided to follow Jesus intentionally, he became a missionary of sorts. He started traveling, telling the story. Jesus is alive. I saw him. He traveled through what we would know as like modern day Turkey, Asia Minor, up around into Europe, down through Italy and Greece. He kind of circled like a racetrack, the Aegean Sea. At first, he started traveling with a man named Barnabas, but now he's traveling with Silas. And in Acts chapter 16, they're going to be forced to recalculate. Read with me, beginning in verse 16. Luke writes, once when we were going to the place of prayer, that'd be the synagogue, he's going to the synagogue to tell the story of Jesus, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. Uh, In this culture, in this part of the world, they believed that the, the, the god Apollo Uh, was inside the python. Literally where it says, let me find my place. Literally where it says she had a spirit by which she predicted the future. Literally that reads a python spirit. Because in this culture, they believe that the python was inhabited by the Greek god Apollo and that the python could see the future. Okay, So this is a fortune teller. It goes on, verse 17. She followed Paul and the rest of us and she was shouting. These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. That's pretty good advertisement. Okay, Imagine the scene. You know, Paul and Silas, they're traveling through a busy street, maybe a busy marketplace. They're on the way to a synagogue. Maybe they're seated at the synagogue and 30 feet into the crowd, 40 feet away. This unknown stranger, this young woman is shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God. They're telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Everywhere they went, she's 10 feet behind them, 20 feet behind them, half a block. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and he said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you, come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. Now, don't misunderstand. It says annoyed, and Paul probably was annoyed, okay? But it wasn't because it bothered him so much. It was because Paul knew that associating The risen son of Jesus Christ with paganism was going to hurt the cause of Christianity. So he casts out the demon. Verse 19, when her owners realized their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and they dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. That's a fine how do you do. This is their first time on the European continent and this is their welcome. They're being forced to recalculate. Imagine now, imagine. That morning at breakfast, Paul and Silas, they're talking about what a great day it's going to be. It's going to be a great day, man. The streets are packed. People are everywhere. We're going to tell our story. Now they're in trouble. Oh, it's about to get a lot worse. Watch. Verse 20. They brought them before the magistrates and they said, these men are Jews and they're throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs that are unlawful for us Romans to accept or to practice. Verse 22. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas. The magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. That's pretty harsh. I mean, they're not given a ticket. They're not told to get out of town. Hey, 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 quiet down. We don't appreciate your message. Why don't you just go on your way? That's not how it happens. Like Jesus, Paul and Silas were stripped. 
They knelt before a column of stone. Their hands were chained around, and someone beat them on the back with a cane or a rod. Their backs would have been bloody. They would have been bruised. They would have been swollen. This would have been brutal. Verse 23, after they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded, guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. Holy moly. Imagine this dungeon type place. It's dark. It's damp. There are rats everywhere. It's a kind of a stone building made with stones that are probably big as a basketball. They're all put together with loose mortar, sandy mortar. Their feet are locked in the stocks. Their hands are probably chained to the walls. They can't lie down. They can't find relief. They're miserable. Verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas raised their fists to God, swore against his name, cussed out their jailer for the beating. No, that's not what they did. It's midnight, and they're praying, and they're singing hymns. That's amazing to me. Okay, what would you have been doing? Now look, look, look. Please don't misunderstand me. I don't mean to offend anyone. I bring this to your attention, church, because we need to grow up in our faith. We need to grow up. Some of you doubt God when the weather changes. Some of you doubt God when the money in your checking account dips below a certain comfortable amount. Some of you doubt God when you battle pain. Some of you doubt God because of your circumstance. Look at Paul and Silas's circumstance. And they're singing. They're praying. Man, does that not speak to you as to the importance of attitude? Attitude is everything. And the other prisoners were listening. I don't know if you know this or not, but people are watching you. They know you go to church. They know you go to this church. And in your circle of influence, that means something. They are arriving at conclusions regarding Jesus Christ, this book, this church, and your following based upon you. Keep reading. Verse 26. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And at once, all at once, the prison doors flew open. Everyone's chains came loose. You can imagine this stone structure and the ground begins to shake and it just begins to disintegrate around them. Verse 27, the jailer woke up. When he saw the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and he was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. And I wouldn't blame him. He's taken matters into his own hands. Do you know why? Because he was a dead man. He was a dead man. This jailer knew that out there in the darkness are some of those prisoners that I beat. And when I try to get out of here, they're going to kill me. Even if he wasn't afraid of the prisoners, I guarantee he was afraid of Herod. Because if you go back in your Bible to Acts chapter 12 and verse 19, the apostle Peter was also in a jail. He miraculously escaped. And Herod, the emperor, Caesar, ordered all 16 guards at that prison executed. This man knew he was a dead man. He's about to kill himself, but then Paul shouts, Hey man, wait! Don't harm yourself! We're all here. The jailer calls for the lights. He rushed in. He fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brings them out of the jail and he asks, Sirs, what must I do to get what you've obviously got? What must I do to be saved? Verse 31, they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. These two devoted followers showed amazing courage in the face of persecution and suffering like you and I will likely never know. They were beaten with rods across their back. Again, one of three beatings that the Apostle Paul endured. He describes those beatings in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25. He was beaten on several occasions, imprisoned on multiple occasions, all because of something 
he believed. And again, first time preaching the gospel to the Europeans. Surprise, I'm here with good news, and they wind up in jail. Welcome to Greece. I said earlier that every prisoner wants to get out. Paul and Silas are the exception. Amazingly, they're in no hurry to escape. Luke doesn't tell us that while Paul and Silas were chained to the wall and their feet were in stocks, they were scheming and planning their escape. Okay, look, you distract the guard. I'm going to get his keys. They weren't digging tunnels. They found some sense of contentment where they were in the poorest of circumstances. Why? I'll put this on the screen. Because they knew that God would be true to himself. That's what brought about the change in their situation. They knew that God would be true to himself, and that's what brought about a change in their situation. Look, if Paul and Silas can do it, why can't you do it? Why can't I do it? If Paul and Silas can endure these poor circumstances, why can't you and I endure a little bit of back pain, deal with a bum knee, wrestle with an uncertain future? They could have been executed in jail. They faced death. And yet the point remains, they knew God would be true to himself. Look, again, I'm not looking to pick a fight. I don't want to offend anybody. But I think the early church, they knew something that maybe we don't know in our comfortable 21st century lives. They knew something that's as important to us as it ever was to them. They knew something that maybe we've never known. Are you ready for this? Here's what they knew. God is not my mama. God is not my mama. Would you say that with me, please? God is not my mama. Come on, say it with a little conviction, all right? God is not my mama. Do you know what Paul and Silas knew? Do you know what Luke understood? Do you know what the apostles knew? Do you know what the followers of Jesus in the first century church knew? They knew that God was not their mama. God never promised to kiss every boo-boo, to massage every sore muscle, to take away all the fear. God never promised to do such things, and they acted like it. That's a job for your mama, not God. God has promised, however, to remain true for him, to himself. God will always be God. He will always be like God. He will always act like God. He will never forget you because he's God. How many times over and over in this book, especially in the Old Testament, when God, using the nation of Israel that he was growing and developing, introduced himself to the world by saying, I am the Lord your God, and I do not change. The Greek gods, the Roman gods, the ancient Egyptian gods, they were changing all the time. Ours is a God who does not change. He will always be true to himself. That means it's his responsibility. God's responsibility is to be true to himself. You know what my responsibility is? To trust him. Well, doesn't that make sense? If God's responsibility is to be true to himself, he's going to keep his word, then it's my responsibility to trust him. I've got to walk in faith. I've got to focus on what I know about him, not how I feel. I've got to try and give him praise and thanksgiving when my circumstances want to give him blame. So, in conclusion, just to wrap this up, let's have a quick review, class. Number one, God is not my mama. I hope you walk out of here and you remember that, because he's not. Number two, his responsibility is to be true to himself. He'll always act like God. My responsibility then is to trust him. You know what I wish? I wish we trusted God more than we trust Dr. Fauci. That's what I wish. I wish we trusted God more than any doctor. I wish we trusted God more than Republicans, more than Democrats. I wish we trusted God because we know it's his responsibility to be true to his word. Let me quit with a passage from Psalm, one of my top 10 favorite passages in the whole Bible. We don't know who wrote this, but we think it might have been David. 
And while David did wind up king of Israel, David lived in uncertainty for years in his life. He faced injustice and unfairness, and he suffered and knew it far more than most of us will ever know. Look at what David wrote, Psalm 91. He who dwells or she who dwells in the shelter of the Most High God. Stop. Dwelling gives the idea of permanence. This isn't a kind of a spontaneous here today, gone tomorrow kind of thing. This isn't a decision we make on a whim. This involves intentionality. I'm intentional in following Jesus Christ. Therefore, I dwell in the shelter of the Most High. That means I'm going to rest in the shadow of the Almighty. You know, <laughs> in spite of all the uncertainty, and I've talked about this for weeks, uh, you know what else I see? This beautiful. I see a lot of rest. I see a lot of, pe- I see a lot of people who refuse to panic. I see a lot of people wearing masks and those not wearing masks who are still resting. They're comfortable. They don't live in fear. Those who dwell in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Watch this. Because he loves me or because she loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue them. I will protect them. For they acknowledge my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I'll be with him in trouble, and I'll deliver him and honor him. Church, God may be this close to intervening in your circumstance. Ten minutes before the earthquake began, Paul and Silas were singing and praying, but God hadn't moved. God may be this close to moving in our great nation. We may be this close to a great awakening of sorts just like the ones we've known in our past. But you got to hold on. you got to trust. you got to let God be God. So instead of waiting helplessly, without purpose, sort of meandering our way through this temporary recalculation, let's trust him. He'll always remain true to himself. Not just then, but now. Let's pray. Our Father, you are a great and good God. Help us trust you. Our circumstances give plenty of reason and cause for doubt, and yet your track record, your word, and your faithfulness say otherwise. May we keep our eyes focused on what we know about you and refuse to become consumed in our circumstance. I pray because of Christ. Amen. Hey, God bless you, Grace Community Church. Fantastic to see you today. I hope you make it a great week. I will see you next time.